This Sokka Dawa broadcast was originally recorded May 29th, 2018, and is brought to you in part through the generous support of the Bob Thurman podcast listeners. To learn more, visit BobThurman.com. Okay. So... Welcome on the eve, near eve, of Sagadawa, Vaishaka, the fourth lunar month full moon, which is Shakyamuni Buddha's, in the Tibetan tradition, his birth time, when he emerged from the right side of Maya Devi, as he was leaning on the Sal tree, uh, his enlightenment day, when he looked up after the long night of meditating and saw the morning star in the pre-dawn clear light twilight and his Parinirvana day where he which people often say his death day but I prefer not to call it that I call it his thorough Nirvana day the Sanskrit Pati does not mean final it means thorough complete. And why was it complete? Because he's teaching that his nirvana is everything. So he's leaving, uh, having allowed and condoned us, his human uh, disciples, his human patients, if you will, as a doctor, he's uh, leaving, getting us to stop thinking that he is inside his skin. And he is everywhere. And he's in all of us. He's the Dharmakaya. You know, in the creation stage of Tantra, they say death becomes the Dharmakaya. So that means the body of reality. It's kind of like, if you, if you consider death a departure simply, he's departing from main consciousness being focused within the Siddhartha slash Shakyamuni body uh, in the Ikshvaku clan, son of Shudhodana and Maya Devi. And he is being Buddha in his reality body of everything in space and time, including all of us in the future. So that's how he did not abandon us. He is here with us, right this minute, right in this thing, right in this like poor, like meat space body of mine, elderly, your nice energetic bodies. He's right here. Uh, I have to blow my nose. Yeah. So on the 29th of this month, May 29th, is that day when everyone commemorates his, the glory of his final nirvana. Of course, from the day he was enlightened 45 or so years before, he was already in Parinirvana, really, in the sense that he's already everyone, even though he's still animating the Shakyamuni body. It's like a sci-fi thing. It's very hard to imagine because we're so focused on being ourselves inside our skin, looking out and listening out and touching and feeling and smelling and tasting that uh, out of our skin that we can't imagine someone who is simultaneously fully there and yet they're everything else at the same time. It's kind of inconceivable, but that's what Buddhahood is. So he already was the Dharmakaya from the time of his enlightenment, actually. And then some people even say he already was long from before, but, and you know, we could, you can play that either way, you know. But the point of him being a human and a prince and a spoiled brat, and then an awakened person and then a self-punisher and then finally a Buddha, is to show us that we can do that. And because, unfortunately, we have to do that ourselves. We have to, and not that we have to be spoiled brats and we don't have to be self-punishers, mortific mortifiers of the flesh, as he was. But we, uh, Maitreya, the next Buddha, is not actually when he, in his human life because of a different social situation in the world. But in Shakyamuni, Shakyamuni Buddha is praised among the thousand Buddhas of this golden age which we exist in, of which Shakyamuni is the fourth, 
and there's another 995 of them. And he's praised in the Sutra of the Thousand Buddhas of the, of the good, goodness Aeon. Uh, he's praised there as the one who volunteered out of a thousand sons of a certain cosmic king and a certain other universe, etc., that when I become a Buddha with my other 999 brothers, I will pick the time when the world is in its most difficult state. And by those difficult, he means where people are most violent and militaristic, and there's not, a, not that much peace on the planet, you know. But the other Buddhas have a better time, and in the case of, uh, because the society is better. And the next Buddha, Maitreya, whose time of advent is somewhat uncertain, but he's already there in Tushita looking down and sending dogs down to be nice to us, so we get a little more trusting of, the, of reality. Uh, so when he will come, we don't know. But we, what we do know is that he will be born in a Brahmin lineage, in the intellectual, you know, priestly, uh, intellectual lineage. And he will be given at his majority by his father the sacrificial post that the Vedic priests have at, where they tie the animals when they make sacrifices. But he will smash that post because he's not into animal sacrifices like no Buddha ever is. And then he will give, it will be a, it's a jewel post in a special thing, all made of jewels. And he gives little shards of these jewels to all of his disciples. And just receiving it, they become enlightened. And he becomes enlightened in one day. No six years of suffering and so on, supposedly. So that's the story of... So that's how our Shakyamuni is so special. And part of his so specialness is uh, the, in, in, in the fact that he already attained it, his final nirvana, he already attained it on the enlightenment time, it is also shown in the Vimalakirti Sutra, my favorite not really necessarily my favorite sutra, but the most useful one in teaching because it's so short. And it has elements of all the other great Lotus Sutra, Flower Ornament Sutra, Transcendent Wisdom Sutra, Pure Land Sutra, Jewel Heap Sutra, all the big great collections. Uh, so that's its favorite. And also I translated it from Tibetan, compared it to the Chinese translations and so forth. Very popular in China, Korea, Japan. Uh, not well known in Tibet, but, you know, popular because Vimalakirti is reincarnated as one of the lamas, in, the lama lineages in Tibet, supposedly. But the uh, thing which it's most famous for is Vimalakirti as a layman being more wise and eloquent and correcting the narrow-minded views of the monks. But anyway, one of the things he does toward the end of the sutra, he takes his whole assembly in his house where he has talked with them, and he takes them to see the Buddha using his miracle powers in a rather quick um, transporter beam sort of routine. Uh, really? <laughs> and uh, when he gets there, he stands in front of Buddha after bowing and paying his respects, because he, although he's almost equal to Buddha in a way, he is a Buddha in a way, as a layman, but um, he still respects the monastic mendicant Buddha, because that's the supreme emanation body. It is that it gives the supreme example to people. And a layman would not do that. Although they can teach, but they won't give the supreme example. <clears throat> and um, supreme example of really putting your life full scale, dropping out, being a mendicant, a monk, and, and putting your life full scale into the quest of enlightenment. That's what's meant by supreme. And anyway, he's standing in front of Buddha, and Buddha says, well, you came over to see the Buddha. Now, what do you see? And he says, when I see a body in front of me, that's not seeing the Buddha. <coughs> God, you have to cut that also. You can do that, right? Mm -hmm. <coughs> it's a tree pollen. What? Tree pollen's really high right now. Oh, it's killing me. Yesterday and today, I yeah, couldn't believe it. I'm all dry. I even I took Claritin, it didn't help. Mm. I was literally explosive. Oh. It's due to the late spring, you know. Okay, so, so Bhima Kirti at the end is then standing in front of Buddha. He's brought his whole assembly, huge group of people. And Buddha says, you came to see the Buddha. Now you hear, what do you see? Or how do you see the Buddha? And he says, when I see a body of a being in front of me, I'm not seeing the Buddha. When I see this, that, you know, he goes on and on and on and on about, in a way, no one separate thing is the Buddha, is what he's saying. 
So he's encountering the Buddha at the Dharmakaya level, which he can, which he knows, because he himself is an emanation that's later revealed in the Sutta of the Buddha Akshobhya of the Eastern Universe, Abhirati. And he came here to team up, tag team with Shakyamuni, actually, in regard to some of the disciples to sort of jolt them out of their narrow-minded narrow -minded attitudes and worldviews. So he, he's shooting at Dharmakaya level, so he's looking at someone, and yet on the Dharmakaya he knows that someone is the same as him and all the other people. And he doesn't just say everything, because then people would think it was sort of no one thing, but he goes thing by thing. That you can't see the Buddha in a way because you are the Buddha. It's like you can't experience clear light because you are the clear light. All your experience of everything else is clear light experience. It's that profound thing. So any guru who tells you they experience clear light, it's a little fudging because they are clear light. You know, the eye does not see itself. You know, cannot. The knife ed edge cannot cut itself. All right? Because you are, without subject object duality, we all are clear light. What a Buddha is, is someone who simultaneously knows that. It's not obscured to them, because they have no unconscious. Everything is conscious. Every cell is conscious to them. So they simultaneously are, know they are aware of their presence in clear light. And they also can be at any level of differentiated existence, relational existence, in order to benefit others in many bodies simultaneously, if necessary, or even as many things. Technically, Buddha is the planet. If the Death Star came and blew up this planet, Buddha could instantly make another one, be another one, rather. Now, of course, he would be the Death Star that destroyed it as well. So luckily, he doesn't allow Death Stars to come here and destroy the planet, nor will he allow us to turn our planet into a Death Star, luckily. He can't force us to be enlightened, but at least he can prevent us from the worst self-destructive things. He didn't necessarily prevent us from seeing at least how destructive we can be, which is what we're seeing nowadays, and our leadership is running away from that in denial. But all the world's people subliminally know that. You know, all the world's people subliminally understood radical impermanence, actually, with the dropping of the first A-bomb. They suddenly realized their own atoms, which they formerly had thought of as little billiard balls that keep them awake, keep them going, that they could become, in a chain reaction, vaporize them, completely vaporize their bodies. The atoms in your own body can vaporize your own body in a chain reaction. Everyone understood that subliminally, except maybe a few people who never heard of Hiroshima. So anyway, we're in this amazing Enlightenment age. And the Vimalakirti in that way also says that the time of Shakyamuni, just to celebrate him, uh, in the Vimalakirti there's an incident where bodhisattvas come from an incense universe, or perfume, I guess, universe, you could say. And um, in that universe, their bodies are made of perfume. They're like, like we might dream you, are, you had a subtle body, like a perfume, like ghost-like Obi-Wan Kenobi type body. Well, they, this is a universe where everyone is like that. The land is also made of perfume. The trees and plants are perfume. And the Buddha's perfume is called Sarvaganda Suganda is the name of the universe. Perfume by all perfumes. And uh, the Buddha is uh, Suganda Kuta, mountain of excellent perfumes. And uh, Vimalakirti, when he wants to feed the audience at his house, thousands of people, because the monks have to eat before noon, and they all went there in the morning, and he, uh, he creates a golden bodhisattva gopher. You know what that means, a gopher, someone who sent out for coffee. <laughs> and he sends him to that universe for takeout from the Buddha of that universe few grains of perfume rice from the Buddha's leftover. He asks that, he tells the Bodhisattva that he creates to go ask for that. And the Bodhisattva goes, comes back, brings it back. But then the Bodhisattvas in that universe who are sitting in their perfume bodies doing perfume samadhis, real deep concentrations, they're highly developed Bodhisattvas, they have magical powers. 
as Buddhas and high Bodhisattvas do, supposedly, although I wish a few would show up around here with them, that I could see. However, they are all intrigued, because they're, maybe they're a little bored with all their samadhis, and there isn't enough action or something. So they say to the Buddha, oh, imagine that Vimalakirti, Bodhisattva Vimalakirti, over there in the Saha world of Shakyamuni Buddha, sending here for takeout from this universe across as many universes as there are grains of sand in 62 Ganges riverbeds. That's really quite a thing. We would like to go and see that universe of his, that Buddha land of Shakyamuni's. Can we go? Can we go? He says, okay, you guys can go, no problem. But when you get there, you have to change your body to be more coarse and don't go there with your perfumed body in a big host, you know, a huge crowd of you, because if those beings smell you, they'll all go nuts. They never smell anything so delicious. They freak out. They kind of have a lower tolerance for pleasure and joy and bliss. So, okay, no problem. They will do that. So then they zoom across with their subtle body travel ability. They beam across, like the Bodhisattva did who took the leftover. And when they get there, they go, pew, what a stinky world. What's the matter with Shakyamuni Buddha? What kind of Buddha land is this? And they get into a dialogue with Vimalakirti. And Vimalakirti says to them, look guys, I know when you up there, or he asked them actually, how does Buddha teach there? And they say, well, he just radiates a different incense, different perfume, and we smell it, and then we go into a new samadhi, and that's how he teaches. We don't even talk. And uh, he's Buddha's, and then they said, how does Shakyamuni teach the Dharma here in this like God-forsaken, benighted world, smelly world of yours? And uh, he says, oh, he says, here is hell, here is the Pretaloka, here is the animal realm, here is suffering, here is the, the God realms of that kind of suffering, etc., etc. He gives a whole thing about samsara and nirvana, you know, the whole Buddha's teaching. He gives a little short list of it, with all of the hard things about it and wisdom and compassion. And then they go, oh, you know, that's so difficult compared to just sending out an incense. And he says, yes, it is, but it's actually better for the beings. They can achieve Buddhahood much better than you guys. Why? You guys can only, with your samadhis, you develop your wisdom, and that's the main thing, ultimately, so that's good, and you're very enlightened, and you have magical powers, etc., etc., but you're going to loaf around in that state for a really long time as for, before you become a perfect Buddha where you can be anywhere and still be in the same bliss and be, be reach out to all kinds of suffering beings without just sitting up in perfume. And he said, whereas in this one, beings are more vulnerable, there's more struggle in this world, it's more difficult, and therefore, and there is closure to suffering. And so therefore the bodhisattvas here develop their compassion with equal strength and power and swiftness as their wisdom. Or a little bit of wisdom maybe takes sometimes a back seat to the developing compassion, but they get, in the long run, they evolve more rapidly to Buddhahood, and that is the skill in art. That's the liberating art of this Shakyamuni Buddha, who is truly great. That he lets things stay, he keeps things stay in this thing. And of course, in the Sutra, as you know, those of you who've read it, and those of you who haven't, I'll sign it. You can get it free on the 84, my translation, which is the better one. You can, the others are okay, but mine is better. You can get it on, on the 84,000work.com website, um, The Noble Teaching of Vimalakirti, free, and download it and read it. And in the first one, the Buddha does show Shariputra, who's questioning that this is a Buddha land at all, because it looks so crappy. They have like horrible politicians in it. And he Buddha puts his toe on the ground after teaching about what a Buddha land is, and then suddenly Shariputra sees himself in the ideal place for his own maximum evolutionary development. They, talk, they say he sees everything made of jewel plasma type of thing. So, for a brief time, he just does a special effect of lifts up see it like that, and then again it looks like it does uh, in our usual habitual perception. So, uh, so this is what we're celebrating today, the Buddha Shakyamuni and his birth, his gracious coming down as supreme emanation body of Buddhas to earth, to the womb of his mother Maya Devi, taking birth, growing up, becoming a Buddha, 
on this day also became a Buddha. And on this day also he then left that body to envelop us all in the Buddha bodies of all the Buddhas who are all enveloping us and completely and suffusing us. And our own Buddha nature actually is the Buddha's minds, all infinite numbers of Buddha's minds in us. Even though we sort of, it seems inaccessible to us most of the time. But it's so encouraging the reality that he discovered and his ability, he didn't create this. He's not assuming, the, and even he transmits the god Brahma, who in India in those days was thought to be the world creator by the Indian people. He, he has Brahma, he accomplishes a mission for Brahma, that god, to tell people, actually God didn't create it. It's beginningless. It had no first creation. We've all been here interwoven with each other infinitely with the gods and the humans and the demons and the devils and the hells and the heaven. We've all been here beginninglessly. And uh, no one is to be blamed for our suffering. We can blame ourselves and we you know, encounter people who bother us and we bother them. And so it's a kind of mutually interrelational event based on really our luck, our not knowing that infinite numbers of beings in the infinite and eternal past have already attained Buddhahood, which made them not omnipotent, but omnicompetent in creating a situation for helping us create a situation and inspiring us and teaching us to come to an understanding of our own true nature, which is blissful nirvana, which is Buddhahood. That's our real nature is Buddhahood. Our real nature is not this sort of divided, alienated, freaked out, people after me, oh, I did this wrong, that wrong, it's anxious, suffering, the suffering of birth, death, growing old, pain, and this kind of thing. And even pleasure not lasting. That's not our real self. That's, that's still there. It's somewhat real, it's, but it's unreal real. Luckily, less real than our nirvana self. And when we attain our nirvana self, it doesn't mean we leave this level. It means we see this level as permeated with the nirvana level. And we don't have any motive to go around and grab stuff in this level ourselves. But we remain, because we're connected with all other beings, we do have a motive to try to help them realize what a great scene it is, how much fun it is, how blissful it is, how great it is, and uh, the infinite life realization. Okay? So that's what we're celebrating today, and that's what I'm talking about. And I, I, am, I want to invite you all to join me. You still have, I think, a few, about eight days or something. You can still join if you haven't. I have, a, unfortunately, I'm sorry, it's, uh, it's a little bit monetized by the wonderful Shift Net that does these great recordings and makes them widely available to people and you can then keep recording them and you can have them if you sign up for that. And um, it's uh, called Revolutionary Enlightenment and it fits with my Inner Revolution book, my Infinite Life book, my Why the Dalai Lama Matters book. And you can join that. Uh, you just have to go to shiftnet.com and ask for Revolutionary Enlightenment and then you can join it. And um, that would be really great if you, I would enjoy it if you would come and enjoy it. But you don't have to. <coughs> <coughs> it's optional and in a way it's the same thing I do now, but in a way they forced me to make it sort of systematic and covering the whole eightfold path, the, the therapy, the educational path that the Buddha, the curriculum that the Buddha set forth to all levels of his disciple of the Noble Eightfold Path. And uh, I'm doing that in another book also this fall, and I'm trying to do it in different levels, reaching out to a larger public than I did when I was academically teaching for the last 50 years, which I'm soon retiring from. So it's sort of celebrating that. And, uh, and as I said, you do, if you don't have time, it's every, every Tuesday for an hour, hour and a half. I, I come on to answer questions at the each, end of each one hour, se approximately one hour session. And um, I just wanted to let you know about it. And um, so that's, and it relates also to the Vimalakirti and all sorts of things. It's lots of fun. So that was what I wanted to say today. And then, but then, then I want to take a little more somber note, though. One last thing. On the planet today, we cannot celebrate Shakyamuni Buddha 
and the glorious opportunity we all have as human beings to become enlightened doesn't mean we have to be Buddhists. I'm very clear, I want to be very clear about that. I follow His Holiness the Dalai Lama that we're not making a competition with Christians, Jews, Muslims, Hindus, Taoists, secularists even, or indigenous folk. We're not competing with them. We're not saying they need to convert to Buddhism at all. We're just saying they had, they were encouraging everyone to know that they can understand reality themselves. They do not need to, you know, take the presupposition of secular science that as much as they investigate, the more things they find out, the more things they'll know they don't know. That's a materialist thing. Under materialism, if you're exploring and measuring a bunch of material, you'll never get to the end if it's infinite. So that's why they think that. But you, you can experience reality. You, you can't necessarily capture it in a mathematical formula or a manipulative set of concepts or a machine, but you can experience it. And actually you have to experience to understand it. And when you do experience it and understand it and all of your being, gut as well as mind, intellectual mind, you will be really happy and released from suffering. And so therefore it's natural that the, the Enlightenment tradition wants to educate you. So my revolutionary Enlightenment is putting it totally in the vein of education and not of religious subscription. And that's really important. So therefore you can be Jewish and do it. You can be anything you want. Although admittedly, it will cause you to redefine those things and get away from the monopolistic elements in their theologies and the monopolistic element in secularism that if you don't, if you believe in anything non-material, non-obviously visibly material, then you're crazy, superstitious, insane, blah, 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 you know, which is their monopolistic thing. So no world theory, one of Buddha's main insights is the real insight of modern science, actually, as, as elaborated best by Karl Popper, the philosopher, that there's no theory is a final dogma that captured reality. All theories are hypotheses that account for experience, evidence, and empirical experience that has been accumulated in the best and most elegant way, but they're awaiting falsification by more experience and more things, so they're not absolute dogmas. And that's really important in how science broke away from the Inquisition and the Church and thought conformity and sort of thing that, they, that happened in the West to a terrible degree. And actually they broke free of that in Buddha's time in India, which is what way ahead of us, which is hard for us in our Western cultural parochial sense of superiority to realize. But it is a fact. And it wasn't a religious thing that they did. It was a discovery that you can know reality. Reality is good. When you know it, you're happy. That's fundamentally what it is. And um, so on the planet today, that whole thing was more or less completely lost in India. It's full force, except in small sub subcultures, never reached the other Asian countries influenced by Buddhism. Some religious stuff have reached, and so maybe a small, like the Zen masters, like a few very enlightened people in the different cultures it reached. But in mainstream, it did not become in any of the other cultures, because they had their other traditions and things, and they didn't really allow it to be mainstream. They had their armies, basically. When Buddhism becomes mainstream, when the Enlightenment tradition becomes mainstream, people stop fighting, pretty much. It does not become an important occupation although it may be some vestige of it, but when it's mainstream, like in Tibet, they demilitarize. You, in, in many different societies in India, before that, they demilitarized. That's how India got conquered. First by the Muslims thousand years ago, then by the Europeans like 300 years ago. Because they became gentle. They weren't armed to the teeth, like the weirdo pirates from England and Spain and Portugal and so on. And France. So... The point is that Tibet is where it went in hiding this full curriculum. And it became mainstream in Tibet, and Tibet demilitarized. And then Tibetans, not only that, they went to Mongolia, which was the big Mongol Empire, you know, which was the most violent conquering group that Eurasia ever saw. And then they became demilitarized and peaceful. 
And then they both got chewed up in the 20th century. So this then burst this hidden crucible of this knowledge and scattered it all over the planet, not to convert the planet to a bunch of, to a new religion, but to be, be meet, meet its inner science, as it's called, to meet the outer sciences of the material world, you know, the rest of the post-colonial, not, or not quite post-colonial world. Okay? Just, um, you can entertain that hypothesis. All descriptions of relative reality are only relative and valid in a context. But this means that we should remember the Tibetans and we should take effort to try to see that they can still flourish in their homeland, which they are not allowed to do because they have been suppressed by a materialist, communist, industrial China. And it's nothing personal about the Chinese who are wonderful people. And for thousands of years also, there were many enlightened people there. And, and there are also a lot of good Christians there, and there's good Muslims there, and there's good Taoists there. So it's not the Chinese personally, it's just they got, in, a, in the context of defending themselves in the not quite post-colonial industrialized planet, they have industrialized. And in industrializing, they wanted the resources and the highland and the headwaters and the timber and many things in Tibet. So they went in and conquered it. And then they, with their anti-religious communist theories, they crushed uh, the, the Buddhism, which they saw as a religion, and forced the Dalai Lama outward and so on. But the, but the spirit of Tibet still lives, and it has affected in a positive way the whole planet, and it's even popular underground in China. I would say it's even popular with the emperor of China, the current emperor, Emperor Xi, who I consider the emperor. And I don't think he's a bad one. I think he's a good one. Although the system still has a lot of bad in it, which he has not fixed, I grant you, at all. Some people think he's even intensified. And they may be right, but I don't think so. So, and here I want to just tell one sad tale that we should keep in our heart, and we should think of what we can do about it. Of a young man who went from Eastern Tibet to the capital in Beijing, and he made a petition to the Imperium, to the ruling party, ruling government, saying he really wanted the privilege accorded to him in the Chinese constitution to do his basic learning in the Tibetan language, which to him was his own ethnic language and a sacred language, a language of great knowledge and so on. And he wanted to be able to study. He didn't mind studying Chinese too. He didn't mind studying English or Chinese or Russian or any other language. He wanted to study them, but Hindi, Sanskrit, you know, where the Tibetan language almost was very highly influenced by, but he wanted to do his basic learning, medium, Tibetan, and was not being allowed to do so. And he said, this is not a request for independence, it's not a request for even intensified autonomy other than is normally promised in the Constitution. It is nothing separatist about it. I am devoted to the motherland. You know, he filled it up with all that kind of piety, meaningful piety. And they still put him in jail. They still imprisoned him for separatism. And he finally got a trial after two years of torture and imprisonment in very, very health-destroying conditions. And then they gave him a five-year sentence. So two, two years served and three more years of time. Of, of really death, deathly time, actually. It's, these people, they don't survive because the conditions in those gulags are so bad. So this is really sad that the great China, which is trying to do nice things, and Emperor Xi goes to Davos and talks about world trade and world prosperity, and China making a contribution, peaceful contribution to that and so on. And yet, this goes on, you know. So we must realize that Shakyamuni Buddha's representative on earth at this time, really his central one is His Holiness the Dalai Lama. I think all other Tibetan groups, although they have different, the different Tibetan sects or orders have their own head figures, which is not the Dalai Lama. He's actually not the head of any one of them, but he's kind of the spiritual head of all of them in another way. And they all respect him 100%, especially, and he's worldwide. He's a Nobel Prize winner. He's also beloved everywhere, even in China. 
underground. But certain kind of old 20th century militaristic hardliners that are still are there, <clears throat> he's a bad, he's a devil, this is real nonsense. And we should all pray for him in his long life. He's now 80, uh, 83, 84 in Tibetan way, because they count the year in the womb as your year one. So he's 84, and he is um, healthy, and you can live stream, get him free, live streamed. Um, you know, www.dalalama.com, Dalai, D A L A I, Lama.com and enjoy his presence on earth as a kind of a symbol or a warranty that we have not been abandoned by the great enlightened figures of thousands of years ago. That the enlightenment still lives, it's still, its teaching is available to us, it doesn't ask us to worship it or to become a Buddhist of any kind in any way, shape or form, but does ask us to educate ourselves, to come to a deeper understanding of ourselves, how our minds work, an understanding of others, be more loving, kind to them, and this we should celebrate as this coming full moon, as it comes up on the 29th. So we include in that our prayers, our prayers to Shakyamuni, our, express our gratitude to his undying, infinite presence around us and within us, and express our appreciation of the Dalai Lama and the Tibetan people and its culture, and pray for the day when the Chinese people, including the government, have recognized that this is a jewel in their crown, their responsibility, let's not call it power over, let's call it responsibility for Tibet, the headwaters of all the major rivers in Asia, and the roof of the world, you know, and let that roof have a shining light, like a lighthouse light on top of it, sending a beam of peaceful light everywhere, even to President Putin, to Viktor Orban, to any kind of would-be dictators, Maduro, Venezuela, our own would-be dictator, down who shall be the unnameable one, down south from here. Let them all be illuminated by that light and, and made and in a way encouraged to restrain their kind of impulse to sort of violent self-assertion. Okay? And meanwhile, let us ourselves be responsible and make our vote and raise our voice in a loving but firm manner against any kind of war and violence and stupidity and so forth, racism, sexism, whatever it is. Okay? So happy Saga Dawa, as the Tibetans call it, Happy Kailash, no, not Kailash, Happy Vaisak, Vaisakha Day. Mill a, a billion Buddhists worldwide, more than a billion, if you really took account, worldwide are somehow making it a special day. They try not to eat meat on that day. They try not to have any family fights or squabbles. They don't work on that day. They make it a vacation day. I know it's a Tuesday this year, but... Uh, that's what they do, and we can imitate that and enjoy it, that the Enlightenment is still with us, in us, and there for us to express on this planet. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Bye. Okay? Study Buddhism up close and personal with Robert Thurman and the Tibet House U.S. membership community during GeoX trips to Bhutan and Mongolia in 2018. To learn more about these Dosset trips with Bob Thurman and friends, please visit bobthurman.com. Thanks for watching.